Evening, ladies and gents. My name is Simon Brown doing this evening's presentation. Bit of housekeeping before we start. I know the lights are bright, massively bright, makes my makeup look ugly, uh, but it works better for the, the periscoping stuff. So uh, we, we grin and bury it. It does also mean you can see your notes better if you're going to make copious notes. And what really matters is the screen behind me. Uh, time wise, we commit to an hour. We've done seven o'clock. We don't want to overrun this. Certainly, we can take more questions and the like afterwards, but I'll finish on time people who've got places to go and things to do thereafter. We do record this, so the, the video will be up um, sometime tomorrow afternoon. If you head over to Just One Lap or our YouTube channel or Facebook or anywhere there, you'll find the links to the, to the videos. We record all of these series as we build up that library. Um, and as you head out, the, just before you get to the reception, there's a TV. Under that is a, is a parking ticket stamper. Stamp your parking ticket so you don't pay when you get downstairs. Cool, so that's the process for you. So last month when we kicked off the, the, the series of boot camps, and we're going to run this all the way through to uh, June of next year, last year we were really looking at, at, at managing risk in, in, in a sense and managing that risk via volatility and what you trade. And we then touched a bit on, on looking at uh, 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 the, 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 the different volatilities. We touched a bit on CFDs as well. And we're going to continue that risk, but we're going to look at margins, we're going to look at leverage, and we're going to look at, at exposure and, and those three components of the risk. And I, the, the, when I was pondering this, I mean, the first question I thought to myself is, what is risk? And in a sense, you think, yeah, that's easy, until you start to ponder it. And, and what we typically say risk is... Um, is we're going to say risk is we could lose money. And that's not wrong, but I think that's scratching the surface to what risk really, really is in a sense. Uh, the one quote, the chance that an actual return will be different than expected, I think is much more important. So what we say, in other words, is ups, you could make money, but there's, so you think you're going to make 20%, but you make 15. The risk is you expect the 20, but you don't make it. And in truth, it works on the downside too. On the downside, we we expecting to make a profit. Of course we are. We wouldn't be in a transaction if we weren't. But there's that downside risk that we actually end up making a loss in that process. So risk is very much around expectation. And in, in the September presentation, when we're back next month, we're going to talk about expectation. We're going to talk about how we, we manage the, 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 the process of, of measuring ourselves and measuring our trading and the like. But expectation is, is a hugely important one. There's a, a bunch of cognitive biases that we have, and a lot of them are, are in that sort of space of the issues around, for example, uh, uh, where, where, where we think we're special. You know, our mothers told us, and, and you know, our mothers were right, but, but we always think it happens to the other guy. You know, that guy busted out, that guy busted me, no, it's not going to happen to me. Um, I'm special in that I'm going to have the giant winning train, and we call it optimism bias. And, as a human trait, incredibly important. We, if, if as a species we weren't optimistic, we wouldn't be sitting here this evening. We would still be in our caves or in the trees or, or whatever the case may be. We need that optimism. That's what drives us forward. That's what makes Elon Musk do crazy things and Bill Gates 30 years before that and, 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 and everyone else in advance of that. We need the optimism. But here, they can set us up, in essence, for risk. And in a sense, they can set us up for failure in that process of, of how we are understanding and, and, and what we are understanding. Other issues we get is that we, we, whatever informs our belief informs our trading. So if we, are, if, if we are generally bearish and we think the world is going to, 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 to hell in a handbasket and that you know, the wheels are going to fall off and quantitative easing and we're going to have a repeat of the 1930s and late 20s, that informs everything we do. Uh, the flip side, if we think that everything's going to be brilliant and, and, and there's no problem and this market can go higher forever in a day, that informs what we do. And the problem is, is that we are typically fairly uh, uh, polarized in our views, very much black or white, whereas in truth, it's mostly gray. The, the, the truth nearly always lies somewhere in the middle. The biggest problem that we come into is the risk of basically finding supporting theories on our beliefs. Whatever you believe in this day and age, you will find a website or a blogger or a YouTube channel that will support your belief. Whatever it is. I mean, the, the, the example I use, I was at school in the 80s in KZN. There was a geography teacher from Peter Maritzburg who ran a th something called the Flat Earth Society. Flat Earth. You did hear me well. 
and they would have courtly meetings of the Flat Earth Society. And not many people attended for two primary reasons. One, it was Peter Maritzburg, and Peter Maritzburg's like, you know, Sleepyville. I mean, I love Peter Maritzburg, but it's Sleepyville. And two, the world's not flat. I mean, we know that. That geography teacher is still around. I think it's the same chap. And he has a Facebook group with 250,000 members. The world hasn't become more flatter in the sense of it's round. The world has become more flatter in the sense of the ability to disseminate data and information. So now when you believe something crazy, that other person who believes the same crazy thing is just an email away. Whereas in the olden days, you could never find them. You, know, you just had no chance at all. So what that does by the flattening it is it can fundamentally change our expectation. And that expectation brings risk. If we take it to the extreme, if our expectation is that we're into a 1929 style crash, then you've missed out on one of the best bull runs that we've seen in the last hundred years because you've been fearful sitting on the sides. If you're of the view that we're never going to have another crash and that quantitative easing solves all the structural problems we have, then you're setting yourself up to get decimated in the next crash because it'll happen as sure as heck. So a lot of risk is actually about the expectation. And then we bring Mark Douglas in, who writes Trading in the Zone, published early 2000s. I still think probably the best book on psychology of trading. Um, we have, some of the concepts have moved on around behavioral finance, but certainly trading in the zone. He says, when we genuinely accept the risks, you become at peace. So the problem with this is that we have any level of expectation. The point with trader is stop having expectation beyond one, the expectation that you will trade well, that you will trade with discipline, that you will trade with structure and rules. What those structures and rules and discipline we will touch in the next session. But actually just remove the expectation. Stop, because if you get into a trade and you say, all I care about is that I executed well, well, then your return is going to be exactly what you expected, right? Because you had no expectation. In fact, your expectation, your return is, I executed well. <coughs> so if we move away from worrying about the rands and the cents, and then we just get to that point where we control what we can and we don't worry about the rest. And in many senses, when we look at risk, and I say, what is risk? We say, the ability to lose money. That, that, that's not untrue. But it only scratches the surface. There's a lot more to it. There's a lot more in terms of how we respond, in terms of our discipline, in terms of our consistency, in terms of our, our belief structures that we have, and those biases that we bring to the party. We're human beings. If anything, we are one big bundle of bias across everything. Almost any topic, anything, what is a bias? A bias is a belief. It's important we have beliefs. In trading, it's important that we don't have beliefs. It's important that the only belief that we have is that there's very little that we can control and that we are comfortable with that and that we will control it. So a lot of that is fairly theoretical and we're going to come back to it, a lot of it in the September session. We spoke about a bunch of it um, in, 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 in July where we spoke about the volatility, the difference between trading equities and FX and indices. Um, and we looked at the different risk profiles there. The conventional wisdom has always kind of said, not the conventional wisdom, the process has always been we trade equities, whereas in truth they're probably the highest risk in terms of volatility. And that's to the point there, if anything, risk is misunderstood. And as traders, we're, we're, I don't want to say we're taking on more risk. We all drove here this evening because sure as heck no one walks in Johannesburg. Now, driving through the streets of Gauteng, that's real risk. Now, and you can get run over by who knows what, and that's it, you know, game over. Uh, yeah, we're just going to lose money. That's nasty, but we'll come out of it alive. Maybe battered and bruised and quite embarrassed, but, but alive nonetheless. But as human beings are concept of risk is actually fairly weak. In many senses, we've still got our, our, our sort of primeval fight or flight. Something scares us, we want to do one of two things. We want to punch it in the nose or run like heck. And we're still vaguely doing that. We still, that's what we look at doing. And, and, and so when the market does something we don't like, um, we could run, and that's not always a bad thing. In other words, kill the position, take the money and get the heck out of Dodge. Or we can try and punch it on the nose. And if you try to punch the market on the nose, 
trust me, you will lose every single time. Typically, when we punch it on the, on the nose, we take a losing trade and we add money to it. Ah, I'll show you. And we add money to it. And it hurts you some more. Ah, you know what? It doesn't matter who you are. Even if you are in Buffett, the market is bigger than you. And if, if we're trying to fight the market, we lose. There's one fight that we have that's worth the fight, and that's the one with us. I ended last month's session by saying the biggest risk to our trading is us, the individual. What makes a trader is the individual. Your trading edge is not the software or the internet access or the fancy laptop. The trading edge is the individual, each of us individually, and how we respond to pressure, how we respond to risk, how we design our processes. And the biggest threat to that is us. It's not uh, uh, Angela Merkel or, 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 or any, uh, I've now forgotten the Ben Bernanke lady. Janet Yellen. Oops, sorry, Ms. Yellen. It's none of those folks. Those are not our, they, yeah, they're incidentary. But we're going to do a lot more damage to the portfolio than they ever will. So often it's the misunderstood. So this evening I'm going to focus on those three components there, the margin, the leverage, and the exposure. We're going to come at it from a couple of different directions. We're also going to look at closeout because this is critical because far too many people, when we start the trading process, and I speak for myself, uh, we simply go too big. And we simply take far too much risk. And I know why. We want to get rich in a hurry. And when I'm saying a hurry, I'm thinking Friday. I'm actually thinking tea time. Uh, morning tea because I've got plans for the afternoon. And as soon as we try and do that, we set ourselves up to get absolutely caned by the market. So I want to run through that this evening and go through it. So that risk is volatility. We spoke about last month's session. Gearing and leverage we're going to touch on now. Expectations we come to in September. And then money management and stop loss. Money management and stop loss. If you've got itchy feet, go to just one lap. You'll find a bunch of videos there on stop loss, the 2% rule and that sort of stuff. You can start viewing those now. But in a broad sense, this is how we're going to manage our risk. That was what do you trade in the diversification across the different asset classes. You know, don't trade Anglo and Billiton, they're the same thing. Trade Anglo and, and the DAX, because they're not the same thing. Um, we want to look at the gearing and, 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 and the leverage. And, and, and in essence, so I use gearing and leverage interchangeably as two words. Some people will say they're different. I consider them exactly the same. They're interchangeable. And exposure is your absolute ultimate risk that you have in the process. So I'm going to see, am I booming out? No, I'm not. So let, let's quickly go back to what is CFDs and let's spend a little bit of time on contracts for difference. If you're trading straight equities, the process is, is obviously different. There's no margins. If you are trading um, uh, uh, indices, same sort of process. If you're trading currencies, futures, same sort of process. Contract for difference, you get expo full exposure risk, but you only pay a margin. In other words, you've got 20,000 Rand in the IG platform, you can get exposure to 400,000 rands worth of certain stocks. Not all of them, certain stocks. Your 20,000 gives you 400,000 exposure. Your risk is not 20,000. Your risk is 400,000. That is a humongous jump. If your salary is 20K a month and you go into work tomorrow and your boss says, boom, you're at 400 a month. Man, you're going to be celebrating for the first two months. It's a massive, massive number. What do we tend to do? We look at this 400,000 and we say, yeah, that's excellent because our profit is based on that. I mean, how much profit can we really make on 20,000? You know, Friday, hey, tea time, morning tea. We can't make much profit on that. So we think, oh, let's make profit on 400,000. We're only looking at one side of that coin. Optimism bias says that we're going to make a profit. What happens if we make a loss? Now we're making a loss on 400,000. That could go to zero. And if you don't believe me, two words. And half of you know what those two words are. African bank went to zero. Your 400,000 went to zero. You lost 400,000. You only had 20. You're 380,000 out of the kitty. Now, in truth, unlikely to happen because African bank kind of went to zero over a period of a year. And long before you lost 400,000, IG phoned you up and said, <laughs> this, this is not playing out, Lacquer. Sorry, but, but no. But that is your actual risk. And the truth is, 400,000 is a large amount to trade with. 
I mean, I, I run my mind through the folks who I know who trade, and two of them, if I include myself, three are occasionally taking trades that size. And between us, the three of us have probably got experience in excess of 30 years. And that's not default. I will typically start smaller and scale into it. Yet a novice will come with 20,000 and just max it out. Just take the whole thing. And, and you know, the, the tagline, and it's because of regulators, but the tagline with, with all of these CFDs and other such products is, you know, your losses can exceed your initial deposits. We never hear that part. That, that, that doesn't even go in the one ear. It just kind of deflects off and, you know, disappears into the ether. Why? because we've misunderstood risk. We forget that risk really is two-sided. And in this case, risk is not perfectly linear. Because your mindset, and I'm just using 20 and 400 as two random numbers, your mindset is around 20,000. This has meaning to you, right? You've saved up to get 20,000. Or maybe you won some money in the lotto or playing poker on the weekend. Or, 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 or maybe you've got a lot of money, but you just took 20,000 out to start this trading thing. The point is, is that that is meaning for you from an emotional perspective. And that meaning is not insignificant. You've taken 20,000 of hard-earned money and you're sticking it into the stock market. Scary. But the first 28 times you do it, scary. And then you just turned it into 400. Emotionally, you can't handle it. You just can't handle it. That 20,000 resonated with you. We've got anchoring bias. The anchoring's on the 20, you turned it into 400. Anglo blinks and your 400 is 398. Big picture, it's nothing. Except you just lost 2,000 rand and you actually only had 20. And that's where your anchoring is. So it's more than just that you've massively gone for the risk. It's that you've gone out of that space where you were comfortable with. It took you time to, to decide which account to open, who to go with, what broker, what product should you trade. It took you time to decide how much money did you need, how much could you realistically afford, how could you get it together and put the money into the account. When you did that transfer, you kind of held your breath as you hit the, you know, the EFT button. And then you just ratcheted it up 20-fold for no reason other than you could. And certainly the short value is you shouldn't. And we're going to delve into that and a whole lot more. So that margin required underlying exposure. So we, what, what have we got? We've got gearing. That is your margin, your deposit, the 20,000. The 400,000 is your exposure. Now those levels will change dependent on the individual share. We'll look at examples in a moment. But what we care about is something called gearing. So we take the margin required, divide it by underlying exposure, and we get what we're at. So, other way, so underlying exposure divided by. So we take the 400, we divide it by the 20, we have 20 times gearing. We take 20,000, we divide it by 10, we have 10 times gearing. What does 10 times gearing mean? For every 1% move in the underlying, so if the underlying is Anglo, every 1% move in Anglo, from your initial deposit, you are making or losing 10%. What do we say? Cool, because we're going to be making. He said that Anglo can open tomorrow. I mean, I was chatting with someone on, on, on uh, earlier today who trades uh, res resource stocks. And his view is quite simple. He thinks he's going to stop trading resource stocks. Because how you trade a stock that's down 6% one day, up 8% at lunchtime, and then closes the day flat? Short answer, you can't. You're just going to get slaughtered. And that's what we spoke a lot about last month, where we actually said, you know, forget stocks, trade FX, trade, you know, but manage the gearing levels. So let's go back. This is a, 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 from last month's presentation, but I want to revisit it. Contracts for difference, CFDs, geared, margin, exposure 25, margin 5, gearing is 5. So an example of a share and a CFD, both 100 rand, 250 of each. But the one you pay 25,000, the share, you pay the full amount. The CFD, you pay 5,000, you pay a margin, you pay a deposit. So what you could typically then do is ramp it up a whole bunch, but nonetheless. So your exposure to both remains 25, but you've got gearing on the CFD. Five times gearing in that sense there. And the payoff, just an example at the bottom, the share moves 10%, so it's the same for both. The profit is 2,500 on both. Your difference is that in one you paid 25, in one you paid 5, so you made 10% versus 50%. 
So that's the attraction to CFDs. Now, don't get me wrong, that is attractive. But we need to manage that gearing column. We need to make sure that we are geared in a perspective which is reasonable, which manages our risk profile, and which most importantly keeps us in the game. There's a view out there that, you know what, if I bust out, no worry, I'll reload with more money. And I don't buy that at all. Notwithstanding, be honest, straight up front, I bust out three times in the 90s. Man, I even lost the t-shirt I got. But the idea that if I bust out, I'll reload, I get where it comes from, but my view is quite simple. So you took 20,000 Rand and you lost it, so you went and got another 20,000 Rand. You still lost that 20,000 Rand. Imagine if you had gone on holiday and taken some awesome photographs or bought Satrix 40 shares or whatever the case may be. We could use the argument that we learned something along the way and we call it school fees. I'm not terribly convinced by that either. That to me sounds a bit like a cop-out. Like I messed up, I lost money, let's call it school fees. There's cleverer ways we can do the school fees. And I think the, the key point is, is that are we going to lose money at times? Yes. Will we perhaps initially lose more than we should? Maybe. But we can still manage that number down. And the difference is, does that 20,000 last you, you know, two months or two years? And if it lasts you two years, you're certainly in a much better position because you've, you've got a lot more experience. Because how do we learn? We learn by situations like this evening. We, we, we learn by reading. We learn by watching. But in truth, we learn by doing. We learn by getting our hands dirty. I can tell you about the emotions of making and losing money in the market. But until you have made or lost money in the market, you've got no sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, it's completely abstract. It's like, yeah, it would be great to make money. And you make it, and it's way more than great. And oh, it will be bad to lose money. Yo, it's way more than bad when you lose money. Particularly when you do something stupid, and you lose a whole bunch of it. Key things, ability to go short, in other words, you can make money on the downside. In other words, you see a share at 200 Rand, you don't own it, but you sell it at 200 Rand. It falls to 150, you buy it back, you made what it fell. Now, there's a process in the background where shares are borrowed and scripts are transferred. For you, the process is simple. You've got zero holding, you sell, you've now got negative holding. It falls, you make a profit because now you've got minus... 100 shares multiplied by minus 50 rand, the two minuses cancel, you've made a profit. So it's the gearing, but it's also that ability to, so, to go short. So here is within the, the so, so different brokers would do it differently. I'll touch on some of the others in a moment, but let's touch on IG right now. So what, 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 what IG does is says, if you buy a share, you tell us what the exposure is, we take your margin rate. So right at the top up there, we've got AECI. So if you buy 10,000 Rand of AECI CFDs, IG says we want you to pay a 20% margin. <coughs> 10,000 Rand, they want 20%, they want 2,000 Rand. Your gearing is therefore 5. Your exposure is 10, that's your actual risk. Your margin slash deposit is 2. Divide that into your 10, gives you a 5 times gearing. If we run a little further down, we get to African Rainbow Minerals. Their margin is 10,000. Sorry, 10%. So if you've got 10,000, they want a 1,000 Rand deposit. Gearing, 10. We drop down to Anglo, 5% margin re required. Gearing, 20 times. In the case of IG, 5% is the least, 25 is the highest. So your gearing is between 4 and 20. Exception. If you're trading indices, it is 100 times. Margin requirement is 1% of the underlying index. The reason why we have different levels is, frankly, liquidity. Tradeability of the share. So you will note that Anglo Gold Ashanti, uh, Anglo American PLC are the two top 40 stocks and they're the two that have the lower requirement. You will note that uh, African Oxygen, uh, Adcorp, um, Adcock, all of them fairly Illiquid shares, what do I mean? They don't trade very frequently and not a large amount of money goes through in any one given day. 
and you'll typically have wider spreads, bid offer spread, in other words, the buyer, the seller will be wider as well. So because that generates more risk, the less transaction means it's harder to get out if you need to get out in a hurry. Because the spreads are wider, it means that you give away more at that entry point, again, adding to the risk. So in that case, they take a higher rate. There are two things that will influence that rate that they look for. One, if you place the stop loss immediately on placing the order, they will reduce it. And two, if, you be, if, you, if your position becomes exceedingly large, they will increase the amount of margin. But that kicks in with underlying exposure of approaching a million rand. So that's starting to get quite chunky. So if your positions get chunky, they increase the required margin, again, to pull the risk down. The last thing any broker wants is for a client to owe their money. That is not the aim of the game. So in many senses, they put things in place that don't prevent you losing money, that maybe slow you down in losing your money. Of course, we are way more skilled than any process or system. We manage to get around those systems and still lose money at high speed. That's because we're humans. We've got fascinating skills. What a lot of other brokers would do, rather than doing a margin rate, they would tell you there is a margin amount. So what's Anglo trading at the moment? Can we say 150? Anglo at 150, they would say, okay, so Anglo's at 150, we want uh, 7 Rand 50 per Anglo share. And ultimately it comes to exactly the same story, 7 Rand 50 is 5% of 150, they're taking, in essence, the same process. They just represent it differently. And you will find uh, so some folks will, will use SAFIC, South African Futures Exchange levels, and then such as what they've done here. And essentially what IG is running is mathematical formulas in the background, looking at the volatility, the risk, and then coming up to the numbers that are here. This entire spreadsheet is on the IG website. You can download it. There's an Excel version as well. I just grabbed the, the first page just to show an example as some of them. And as I said, ranges are between 5 and 25%. And I know what happens because I was there trading, many, trading CFDs many, many years ago. And even when I did this, as soon as I opened this page, what did my eye do? My eye ran for the one that required the smallest amount of money. It so happened to be Anglo-American and Anglo-Gold Ashanti, and I thought, there's no chance I'm going to trade either of those. I don't trade shares anyway. But what did I do? I went automatically to those two. Why? Highest risk, highest reward. The mistake we make is that we think that there's a perfect linear relationship and that as risk goes up, reward goes up too. And it's not linear. As a rule, risk goes up faster than reward. Why? Because of our emotional response to making or losing money. I mean, in, in pure math, yes, the relationship is linear. But when you're losing money and now need to make informed decisions, when you've deposited 20,000 into your trading account and you've taken a full position on Anglo and you've got 400,000 Rand exposure to Anglo and Anglo drops a measly 2.5%, but you've just lost a quarter of your portfolio. In fact, now you've lost half of your portfolio. Your brain's not going to work very well the first hundred times that happens to you. In fact, your brain probably never works very well when you lose half of your portfolio in the opening half hour of the market. And, and that's probably a good thing. We should never be comfortable with losing half our portfolio in 30 minutes. That's, that's not what we're trying. You know, we're not trying to learn to manage the pain. We're trying to learn to avoid the pain. Rather, make sure that doesn't happen. So because of that ability for us to start thinking clearly and to do the right thing at the right time for the right reason and to exercise discipline, that makes our whole risk-reward process just not fall out of kilter. And we're going to make terrible, terribly bad decisions that are going to ultimately cost us vast amount of money. So what we ultimately need to do is how do we manage gearing risk? Quite simply, we don't go all in. All in is a poker term. When you take all your chips and you say, I bet the whole lot, every last cent. And all in and trading is exactly the same. When you take your 20,000 and you basically throw the whole bunch into the market as margin. You take your 20,000 and you go and put it down for Anglo and you get 400,000 exposure to Anglo. <coughs> you are all in. 
And the problem with all in is that there are, there are no guarantees. There are likelihoods. The likelihood is that if you're all in, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt massively. So what we need to say is, actually, hang on, let's pull back. And I mentioned it last time and I come back to it. Ideal gearing level for a portfolio, two to three times. In other words, we've got a 20,000 Rand portfolio. Instead of taking 400,000 exposure, we take ourselves 40 to 60,000 Rand exposure. So our portfolio is geared. Our 20,000 is worth two times 40,000, three times 60,000. Where does that number come from? That number comes from a bunch of places. It comes from Garth McKenzie. He never gears his portfolio more than three times. And he is as far as I know, the most successful person who trades in public. There are a lot of traders out there, but there's only one who really trades in public and does the levels of returns that he does. And he will never gear his portfolio more than three times. And you, I speak to other folks. I speak to Warren Peacock. Um, he looks at two and a half to three times as his max gearing to his portfolio, his max uh, uh, leverage on his portfolio. Um, the one exception that I know of is uh, Petri Ragnhuis, trader Petri on Twitter also writes a fortnightly column for us. But he will start off one and a half times geared. He will end up seven or eight times geared. But by then, he's got trades that are 20, 30, 40, 60% in profit. In other words, if he has a massive winning streak, his gearing level increases in his portfolio. And that, that makes sense. So you don't start off high geared, but as it goes in your way, and in truth, that can happen to the point where the stop loss is you're pretty much sitting in profit across the board, but your gearing level is high. So how do we manage this process? I'm sticking with a 20,000 portfolio as the example I'm using, and I'm saying so we open three positions tomorrow morning. The first position, we take a long trade in Anglo. 5% margin required. So we take 20,000 exposure, costs us 1,000 in margin. But our exposure, our risk in Anglo is only 20,000. The second position in AECI, AECI 20% margin required. We want 20,000 exposure here, margin is 4,000. Third position, African Rainbow, again we are long, 20,000 exposure, 10% margin. So we end up with 60,000 total exposure. On a 20,000 portfolio means I'm three times geared. Now, in truth, I've just done these as, you know, 2020, 20, 20. When we look at properly managing our, our risk management, and we look at proper risk management, and we look at things like 2% rule and the like, and we, co we cover those in later presentations, we're going to just one lap, you'll find videos on 2% rule there. Those, you know, Anglo might have a higher, it might be, that Anglo might be 30,000, AECR 20, and African Rainbow 10. What we're doing is we're making sure that the overall portfolio is not massively in risk. What we've also done is our total margin requirement is only 7,000 Rand. So we've actually got 13,000 Rand left over, which means that if we have a rough day and all three stocks go against us and we lose some money. We're not getting margin calls. Margin calls are when your broker phones you and says, you're running out of bucks, send money quick. Which for the record, is never a good idea. Do not send money. No, you're in a losing position. You're adding to it. It's like marrying your ex-wife. <laughs> now, ponder that a moment. So. You want to keep that level low. And I know what a lot of you are looking at this and thinking, yeah, you know what, the math is right, but there's a distinct problem here. It's going to take me time to get rich. Yes. One way we get rich in a hurry. Marry money. Of course, if it's your ex-wife, then you're really messed up. Getting rich is a process. Trading creates wealth. Does it create wealth in a hurry? Are there stories and adverts and things on Facebook which tell you about this person who yesterday was living under a bridge and today is buying a Ferrari? Yes. If they are true, and no one believes them, if they are true, that's the one in a billion. And so there are seven billion people, so there are six other people out there who might get lucky. Maybe you're one of those six. 
Odds are not good. Trading is a process. It takes time. What we learn, the skills that we learn and the skills that we develop are humongously powerful for two simple reasons. We'll always have them, and thanks to the beauty of the Internet, we can execute them from anywhere where we have Internet connect connectivity, which is fast becoming most corners of this planet. And that's the real benefit. I spoke about it last time. What do we really want? Freedom from ties that bind. We don't want to be day traders. We don't want to spend our life sitting in front of a screen watching charts. We want to be lazy traders so we can do things that we enjoy, which may or may not be your job. Depends if you're fortunate or not. But it's going to take us time to get there. Like anything else, it's going to take us time to get there. The key thing by doing this is that we stay in the game. We don't bust out. This we, this, these, these shares collapse in value. They've got to lose 35% in a flick of a switch, and you're bust out. The last time I market lost 35% in the blink of an eye. 1929. No one was alive then. Well, none of us. 1987, October 22nd, our market lost 22%. Closed on Monday, opened on Tuesday, 22% lower. In that portfolio, 22% lower, you're still in the game. You're not wiped out. Is our market going to open 22% lower one day? Maybe. And I say maybe because we've brought in technological advances that are designed to prevent such a thing. So if the market falls by a certain amount, they shut it for half an hour so everyone can calm down. I don't know about you, but if the market's falling and then they shut it for half an hour, that does not calm me down. But nonetheless, if it carries on falling after the half hour stoppage, they shut it for an hour. And when they reopen, if it continues to fall, they shut it and say, come back tomorrow. None of that really works for me. But and if you look at the JSC, we have individual volatility auctions. So if a stock falls or moves by a certain percentage in a day, and the big stocks is typically 5%, that stock automatically goes into volatility auction. So what they're trying to do is not to stop the collapse, but in a sense, slow the collapse. So the crash of, well, the crisis of 08, 09, from top to bottom, was worse than 1987. We lost 50% from the peak of 08 to the trough of 2009. 50% down. But our worst single day was only 8%. Our worst week was only 20%. Crash of 87, 22%, first five minutes. In those days, the market opened at 10. By 10 past 10, we were 22% down. And they didn't stop trading. They just carried on shouting at each other. So suddenly, your portfolio can withstand a proper crash. When Anglo-American canceled their dividend a few years ago, stock lost 16% in, I mean, like a minute. 16%. This portfolio can survive that. And that's what I spoke about in the last session. Stocks are volatile. And if you had been gone into the long weekend short of Billiton or Anglo Gold Ashanti or Kumba, I mean, that wouldn't have been the worst trade you could possibly do, except this morning they were all up 6 or 7%. Now, as I said earlier, I mean, trading commodities right now makes Russian roulette look like a safety game. But this happens. Remember when, when Aspen announced that Glasgow clown Smith was selling 6%? Aspen lost 9 Remember when they had that secret telephone call last year that we weren't invited to? Only the big wigs were invited. And they lost 6% in half an hour. No one even knew why. That's what stocks do. That will survive it. And the most important part of trading is to stay in the game. Stay alive. Because when the money's gone, we ain't no more alive. Now, there's another view to this that says if you're long Anglo, long AECI, but short African rainbow, in other words, making profit from the downside, you're mitigating risk. 
And the argument's quite compelling because Anglo and African Rainbow are similar-ish. They're both resource companies, right? So if Anglo's falling, probably so is African Rainbow. So they offset each other. And I hear you on that. But I'm not convinced. Because stocks do crazy things. What you're looking there at is a broad category. Individual shares will move sometimes. and Some days Anglo's up and Billiton's down because one of them published results or you know, one of them, whatever the story might be. So I don't look at the long short differential. I just look at exposure. So if my exposure is negative because I'm short, I don't care. I add it. I forget the negative. I add it into that process. And we spoke about last time. We said ideally, when you're at that position here, you're three positions, you're fully up, you're three times geared, you've got 60,000 exposure on a 20,000, no new positions. In other words, that's it, you're fully in the market. And yes, you've got 13,000, because you've only got 7,000 of margin, you've got 13,000 lying there doing nothing, looking lazy. That's cool. It's called a safety net, it's called a buffer. It keeps you sane. It also means, remember I was speaking a moment ago, when you deposit that 20000 into the market, it's kind of a bit tough on the head. And if you've only taken seven of the 20 in margin, it actually makes you more comfortable, makes you more relaxed. You're not all in. When you go all in, it's stressful. You go all in with aces, it's still stressful. You go all in with the best trade in the world, in theory, it is still stressful. Because you simply don't know what will happen in the next moment. Last month we spoke about ideally no more than three or four trades at any one time. And there's two reasons why we look at that, why we say that. First and foremost, because it's as a human being incredibly difficult to monitor more than that many trades. Our ability to multitask is zero. Multitasking is a complete... <laughs> It, it's an anti-productivity tool. The most productive I've ever been was when I have one screen. I, you have six screens, what do you do? Nothing. Nothing. You spend all day looking for your mouse on the six screens. <laughs> Narrow it down to two screens, one screen. Boom. You know why? Because we've only got one brain. We do one thing at a time. It's just that simple. Yeah, unconscious competence, I get that. We'll go into that in time. But we need to focus, and we can't, you know, three or four trades is about that limit. Three or four trades also means that you can be across your different asset classes. So you can have a currency trade on the go. You can have a commodity trade. You can have an equity trade. You can have an index trade. Or maybe you, I don't trade equities, so, and I don't trade commodities. So it could be two, two indices, two currency trades on the go. It also means you're quite possibly going to spend a lot of time sitting in cash, which is not a bad thing. I said it before, when we enter a trade, we're at the biggest risk. Why? Because we just paid brokerage fees. We're the furthest away from our stop loss. And we've just crossed a spread, that difference between the buyer and the seller. And we're in the market. We're taking risk. So in truth, we want to do less trades if possible. We want to, and I don't want to say we want high conviction trades because, you know, if you tell me you only do high conviction trades, it means that you once did low conviction trades. And then I'm going to say, like, what? You like had a trade and said, this trade looks like rubbish. I know, I'll take it. No, man, we, of course we only do. There are asset managers out there who will tell you they only buy high conviction stocks. I'm like, yeah, didn't they teach you that in the first minute of asset management class? You buy the stuff you believe in. You don't buy the stuff you don't believe in. I mean, who is this asset manager who looks at a stock and says, it's rubbish. I think I'll buy some. No. So it's not about the high convictions or not. But it's about designing systems that are, in the truth, lazy, systems that let us have a life. And that's where we get to. So ideally, your exposure, the example I've given you there, three trades, you're maxed out. If you want to make it up to four trades, you would have, in there, had 15,000 exposure per each. And those three trades would have taken you to 45,000, which would have put you at two and a quarter times geared, space for one more trade. And this does mean that you don't trade the whole market, which is exactly the process. The actual trade sizes, I touched on it, the 2% rule would define the ultimate size. It's unlikely every trade would be 20, 20, 20. It would be maybe 23, maybe 12, maybe 18. 
but in each case your risk would be the same. Questions on gearing portfolio leverage risk? So the question is, it doesn't tell you, you, you've got to basically work it out manually. So what you need is that list sort of printed out somewhere. So what you do, and you're correct, when you put a stop loss in your margin changes, um, they require less from you. Ignore that. Run it the first way without the stop loss. You run the formula and you say, right, this is what I need. Boom, I'm off. What I'm suggesting is because the gearing that's been averaged here is between 4 and 20, and I think 4 times geared is too high, is that in truth this becomes obsolete. This doesn't become massively important because what we care about is that underlying exposure. So you're buying Anglo and you say, right, I want to have most of the three trades. I've got 20,000 Rand. I'm prepared to take 60,000 total exposure. So the third goes to Anglo, 20,000 to Anglo. Boom. 20,000 exposure to Anglo happens to cost you 1,000 Rand. You put a stop loss in, that 1,000 Rand value will actually drop further. Hedging it, yeah. How long can you hold it for? You can hold it forever. You can hold it for absolutely indefinitely. There's no additional costs. There's a funding cost. I'll come to that in a second. They never expire. So you can hold the CFD forever in a day. You then pay interest every evening. And remember, you pay interest on that 20000 because you've borrowed money. So IG has gone to market and bought you 20,000 rands worth of Anglos so that you can make the profit off it. IG is many things, but a charity they are not. Well, they gave us free munchies, but <laughs> aside from the snacks, no further. So they charge you interest on it. You also, at the time, are earning the interest on 20,000 cash deposit in your account. And then as that trade goes into profit, you only realize the profit when you sell. Some brokers will give you the profit every day. So at the close of business, they give you the day's profit. Next day, they take the losses. The interest when you are long, you pay. And when you are short, you receive interest. Because what have they done? They've gone and sold the shares. So you receive interest. At the moment, in our current environment, the interest that you pay and the interest that you receive are both tiny, tiny numbers. And certainly that's not how we make money. So if the trade's going in your direction, you can hold it forever. The problem is if the trade goes sideways, it costs you money. Every day you pay interest on 20,000. If the trade goes sideways for 10 weeks, you've paid a lot of interest for not much privilege. It's why a trade must always have a time frame on it as well. You enter a trade, how long do you expect this to run for? A week, a month, a year? It doesn't have to be exact, but if you say, I think I'm going to make a profit in, in, a, in a week, and six weeks later the thing has gone exactly nowhere, well, then time to get out because it's costing you money. If you buy the equity, no problem. It's only an issue when you're buying derivatives because derivatives cost you money every single day, including weekends, public holidays. More questions here? Yes, we're going to talk close out in a moment. They're not, that's long before that happens. But, so let's say tomorrow morning we wake up and Anglo, AECI, and African Rainbow have all gone bankrupt overnight. And they're all currently trading at zero on the market. You've lost 60,000. They already had 20. They want the other 40. So you can, you can gear that even lower down. So, so absolutely. I mean, what I've done here is, is 20, 20, 20, and run it higher. You could actually do, make those a third the size, and that's six, six, call it seven just for rounding. So you take 7,000, 7,000, 7,000 exposure. These go to zero. You owe them a grand. And that's only because of rounding. If we've done six, eight, they all go to zero, which, you know, the only way that happens is these three companies go bust overnight. But, but let's pretend they can. And short answer, I like the idea. Because what are we saying? There's stuff to learn. So you know what? Let's learn in a really, really safe space. Let's learn where the only way that I can lose all my money and no more, just all my money, is if those three companies go bankrupt. So we can almost be so brave as to say, I can't lose all my money. I mean, never say never, but we can almost say never in this case. That's a sweet place to learn from. And we don't stay there forever. But certainly we start there. Because what are the things we've got to learn? 
we've got to learn the impact of a stop loss. We've got to learn how to click a buy order in IG. We've got to learn how to place a stop loss. And once we've learned all of that, now we've got to learn charts and psychology and systems and risk and how much better to learn that when actually we don't have any extenuating risk in the process. So stop losses start to get interesting. In essence, if you put hard stops in there, excuse me, you put hard stops in there and say you put them at 10% down for each of them, in essence, you're saying all you can lose is 6,000 Rand. 2,000 there, 2,000 there, 2,000 there. Couple of points. Stop losses have benefits, guaranteed stop losses have costs. But to my mind, you have to trade with the stop loss. Problem with the stop loss is, I mean, if it closed there and goes bankrupt overnight, and, and trust me, companies always go bankrupt overnight. No one ever sits down at lunch and decides to make a company bankrupt. They decide at dinner to make a company bankrupt. Trust me on that one. I've been in this game a long time. There are no lunchtime bankruptcies in this game. It is nighttime bankruptcies. And we're going to spend a, a lot of time on stop losses as a stop loss is your most important tool. The other protection that we have is something called closeout. In the olden days of trading, closeout was when your broker phoned you up and said, Simon, you are out of money, please send more. And you would say, no, 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 close my position. Although the problem is they would phone you today at 11 o'clock for money you had lost yesterday. So by the time they phoned you, you had lost more plus more because the market's been trading today. But now we've got this thing called the internet and we get closed out pretty much in real time. What happens in a closeout is that when your overall value starts approaching zero, IG starts selling your positions, end of story, no questions asked. If you've got a stop loss in place, you should never get to that. But in this example here, where you've got 20,000 total portfolio, IG doesn't want you to lose 21,000. So when you've lost 19,900 Rand, they are starting to panic. And they, you are moving into closeout mode. Now, there's different levels in the closeout, but in essence, they're going to start sending you ever so slightly frantic emails. Very polite, slightly frantic. Dear sir, madam, send money now. Do not ignore those emails. Do not send money. It's good money after bad. In essence, the closeout almost acts as a last resort stop loss. But the problem with the last resort stop loss is that you are really at last resort. And whilst IG would do everything to prevent you losing money, because not to prevent you going into negative, because they don't want you to owe them money, that's complicated. They will do everything in their power to prevent that happening. There are no guarantees. So as soon as your portfolio value, and remember that 20,000? Seven of it was actually for margin. Is that, so they'll show you that there's 20, but seven of it has been held for margin. You're earning interest on 20, but seven has been held for margin. So you got that 13. And when that 13 is all gone and you're down to the last little bit, you start getting the emails. And if you don't start closing positions and exiting or adding money, terrible idea. If you add money, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how to do it, but don't tell your friends. So you deposit money. You go onto the website and you upload proof of deposit. Do not wait for it to clear because, you know, when you send money from one bank to another bank, it goes on the holiday for two days. Send the money, get the proof of payment, upload it onto the website. You log on, you upload proof of payment, they will credit the account. But don't do that. I do, if so, you get the emails when you're close, and then you get a level two. They call it COM1, COM2, and then the last one is COM emergency. Probably not, but when you get those com ones, log on, phone the call center, start closing positions. If you don't, IG will close on your behalf. No questions asked, and they work on the 
first in, first out principle. So the trade you opened longest ago, they start closing the position until your account is back into positive territory again. And then they stop. And if it carries on going bleeding and losing money, they start selling again to bring your account back into positive territory. There's no nuance about what they sell. They literally do first in, first out. The one you've held the longest, the one they sold first. And they sell it until they get you to a position where you're profitable. And then they stop selling. So how do we avoid closeout? Have a strategy, have an exit, have a stop loss. If you're trading without a stop loss, you're going to go, I mean, I make one promise. I do, I don't know, 50, 60, 100 presentations a year for 15 years. I make one promise. If you don't have a stop loss, you will go bust. Maybe not today, maybe not this year, but you will go bust. That I guarantee you. A stop loss is a predetermined level at which you exit, no questions asked. And that level can change. Your stop loss, when you enter the position at 20 rand, your stop loss might be 18. And then the share goes to 25 and your stop loss goes to 23. Cool. Stop loss never goes down. So a stop loss can move up as the share goes in your favor. But you always, always have a stop loss. Without it, one day, if you don't have a stop loss, what are you doing? You bet the farm every time you trade. And you bet the farm every day. One day you wake up. You ain't got a farm no more. So it's stop loss. It's about the portfolio, which gives you more wiggle room. The problem with that only a three times geared portfolio, the trick is quite simple, is that you've got a lot of space before you start getting closed out. And you've got 13,000, in your example, even more, before you actually start getting closed out. Closed, you know, if you're a trader and you come to me and you say you've never had closed out, then cool. That's the best thing I want to hear. Traders, you've never, when I'm talking about that closed out email, you're saying, what? Never heard of it. Boom. Love it. That's what we want to hear. No closed out emails. Because then you're trading properly. Maybe not profitably, but properly. The two are slightly linked, but surprisingly different. And it's about monitoring your trades comes back to only having three or four. Don't try and do 20 trades. And, and then these days with, with, with apps and technology, there's dozens of ways we can monitor them. It's about what you trade in terms of volatility. So closeout is one of those things which hopefully never happens because we are long gone before we get to... If you're going to close out, you're, you're busting out. Your portfolio is going to zero. You're losing all your money. That is the last thing you ever want to happen as a trader. So some homework, some things to ponder. Portfolio gearing, portfolio gearing, managing risk, expectations. I kicked off with expectations this evening. We're going to come back to that next, next session, which is 15 September. We will go into a lot more detail about expectations. This evening's some hard and fast mathematical stuff, which is difficult. Next month we do the hard and fast airy-fairy stuff, which is also difficult because it's psychology and the like. Um, expectations. Manage that risk. Stop losses. Do some digging on stop losses. Go look about the 2% rule. Look at, at the differences and look at that portfolio gearing. Look at your own portfolio gearing. Look if you can't pull it down. If you're pushing it higher to your point, the question is what are implications? Costs of guaranteed stops. If you're pulling it down to almost guarantee that you can't go bust, I love that idea. Absolutely. This is a long journey to becoming a, a, tr a trader. Yeah, you know, there's brain surgeons, there's traders that take about the same amount of time. They do about the same amount of damage if you get it wrong. Well, one leaves your brain dead, one leaves your wallet dead. What's the difference? You've got no money, <laughs> your brain ain't going to help you in, in, in the process. It, it, it's a long process. Staying in the game for as long as possible is the best part of it. And these are the bits that we're running through in the stuff. So we've looked at emotions, risk, strategies, disciplines, exposure, what we focused on a lot this evening. These are what we're going to come through as we go through to the sessions. Fo uh, folks, if you photograph on the screens, you're welcome to, but you're equally welcome to mail me and I'll send you the PDF every session as well. Um, yeah. I, I've been very, very hurt by not having a guaranteed stop loss for that exact reason. Um, when would I use a guaranteed stop loss? I want to say every single time. How much does it cost you? It costs a fee. It, it, it's, it's, it's darkly onerous. I think about 
The few times I've missed a stop loss, not often, in 15 years, it's hurt. October last year, 28th, was it the 28th? I'm short this market. I go off to some place where they mine diamonds. What's that place? Cullinan. I'm completely offline because I don't, yeah, anyway. I come back at half past four on Friday and China did something. I can't remember what. Our market's up 2,000 points. I'm trading Aussie, 12 contracts, 10 rand a point, 2,000 points. Kaboom! My stop was like, you know, the market is here. My stop loss, I lost hundreds of thousands. If the stop loss had kicked in, I would have lost 60. Now, the point is swings and roundabouts. That's happened, that sort of disaster has happened to me. Okay, when I exclude the times where for it's human error, so I've done some stupid things in my life, but if I exclude those times, it's only happened to me three times, but it's cost me hundreds and hundreds of thousands. If I could do guaranteed stops, I think I would do it every time. Yeah, and this is completely onerous. Um, and and I, 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 in the back of my mind, I think, I, I don't want to say because in case I'm wrong, I don't think it's so terribly, I think over a trading life, the cost on guaranteed stops it's going to be way cheaper than missing it badly two or three times. You know, when you miss it by a couple of points, yeah. It's when China did something and the market went 2,000. We, we got limit up. I didn't know we had limit up. You go up 5%, they shut Safex. It's like, you can't do that. I've got to get out. And the problem was they didn't know what to do. It had never happened before. So they didn't know how to open Safex. So I'm sitting there like there's some techie and I'm waiting on some techie to solve a problem so that I can take a 240,000 rand loss. Amount of fun involved? Nothing. My weekend in Cullinan? Well, we went and drank beer. <laughs> About 240k's worth. <laughs> Didn't leave that brewery for the whole weekend. I like, you know what it is, because it just solves so many of my problems. Overnight gaps, everything. Fifteen September, we back. We're going to look at trading plans. We're going to look at stocks, journals, how to measure success, when to trade, particularly the success part, measuring our goals, understanding excuse me, what makes a perfect trade, understanding what we need to monitor, understanding what's important. And surprisingly, it is not profit or loss because we have no control over that. As always, we'll be here. We're on webcast. If you can't make, the videos are available. Booking is open. Go to ig.com, Zars Seminars. Uh, legal stuff, make money, it's yours, lose money, no longer yours. The lawyers say it different. Um, and then contact details. I've got two minutes for a last question or two. Cool, we'll park it there. Um, ladies and gents, I'm talking a lot of stuff, and I've got a particular process I'm moving on through these sessions. But if stuff is interesting, you go off and Google, go to Just One Lap, go to IG, they've got stuff as well, and, and, and learn in parallel. You know, there's no, it doesn't have to be a one-off process. This is something that's going to take a whole bunch of time. Remember, uh, stamp your parking ticket on the way out so the lady or the gentleman downstairs won't charge you for your parking. There are some snacks. We will take more questions. Thank you very much for your time this evening.